Right. So. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Done. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Subscribe. <laughs>
let's just re mangle, manipulate the DOM, add things, remove things, instead of doing a full page reload. Yeah. And this has been, things have been built on top. You, you have routing, client-side routing. There used to be a time where you used the anchor, like the, the hashtag, and then a pseudopath to yes. actually emulate that it was a real site, even though it was not. And then JavaScript would pick that up and load the correct data and render it. And Well, the reason we did that is because that was the only way that you could commit a navigation into the history right. stack um, without triggering a page reload. Oh, okay. your, your fragment navigations were the only way of doing that. <laughs> OK. But yeah, so those, I guess, are the, the two paradigms, MPA and SPA. And then there was this huge discussion on Twitter about, I guess, which is better. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I find myself standing up for MPAs a lot. Um, and I think people think I'm on. Team MPA, but, <laughs> and maybe I am, but but I would say like you know, Squoosh, SVG, OMG, uh, things which I work Prox. on frequently. Prox, uh, there's these are SPAs. Yeah. Um, and, unless we decide that having to fetch content is is part of that definition, but I don't think it is. And but then there's my blog, um, <laughs> tooling report, and like the CDS site when I was the Chrome Dev Summit site when I was doing that, and that, like these are MPAs, right? I mean, and, and, and actually, personally, it usually drives me mad when I see a blog not being an MPA. So, and that was the question being raised on Twitter: was that is that actually bad? Like the the, mm. the, the whole discussion was, what about SPAs everywhere? Uh, particularly, if SPAs were perfect, are they always better than an MPA? Oh, that's an interesting question, though, isn't it? Like, I feel, for example, I think someone. <laughs> Don't want to, you know, don't want to like call them out too much. But my go-to example for bad SPA behavior, and I think it's actually something that you taught me, is GitHub. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Because uh, you, 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 mind, you click but, yeah. a thing, and you see their own implemented progress bar loading, and it takes a while, and then you see the next view when you've done an experiment where actually loading the target URL in the window is faster. Yeah, and you know what? And through the art of editing, that video is going to be playing now. Uh, what you're seeing is this is genuinely me at Heathrow Airport. Um, and I click a link on, on GitHub. And what it does is it does this SPA style, go and fetch everything, pops it on the page. And it's you know, in the time it's doing that, I can open the link in a new window, and it's faster. And I guess it would be interesting to maybe come up with the downsides of SPA, because that is one of the main ones, is that you lose the content streaming. and that's. The huge skill of the web, I feel like, as a whole, as a streaming platform, that you can start showing content despite not everything having been downloaded fully yet. Yes. And that's, I think, my issue with blogs, because blogs inherently are usually a top to bottom consumed item. And so when the top loads, you can start reading while three pages down, it's still loading. That's fine. The yeah. user can already start loading. And so with an SPI approach, at least how it's usually implemented, you load the entire page. You load the JavaScript. JavaScript then goes off, fetches the content, and then loads the entire content, turns it into a DOM object, and then appends it so you get one big reveal at the end. And there are hacks you can do, um, and they are very hacky right now, in order to stream like, HTML into the yeah. page. But you know, if you've got um, like something that you can iterate over, like if it's a series of tweets, for example, mm -hmm. you could use some format like newline delimited JSON or something True. to bring those in in a similar way. Like this is this is solvable. Since we have at least now that you know readable stream and stuff is exposed on Fetch, you could literally try and like go through the response and start putting things in the DOM when they're ready to be put in the DOM. Yeah, and or, you can. There's a really uh, sort of very hacky piece of code that you can do. You can create a, a new document that isn't attached to an iframe, and you can actually call document.write in that with some text. And then inside that document object, which you know, isn't being displayed, but it starts generating mm. nodes, and then you can drag those nodes out into the page. Right. And you, so you can, you can stream HTML if you're willing to you know, jump through the, the different those behaviors hoops. that you get from that. Yeah. yeah. So maybe like, yeah, what, what other downsides of SPA do we have? And like, are they like things that we can't fix, or other things? That I mean, one of the classics is it does rely on JavaScript, where technically you don't need JavaScript, right? Like, it's it's, it's a huge complexity leap. Uh, uh, yeah. So things like the history API, um, very 
weird API to suddenly have to drill down to, to get proper URL bar behavior. And back and forward to work. Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. And that, there is a lot of stuff that that involves, which might not be obvious at first. Things like form state. The browser does a lot of that itself. Um, there is um, scroll position. Ooh. If you've ever done made your own SPA thing, yeah. you'll have encountered like this is this is one of the things you have to fix because you you know you're on one page, you SPA into a new page, you scroll down, you click back, you're still in that scroll position. Like, yeah. You need to reinvent that caching of the scroll position between views. Um, but again, this is a solvable problem, and it's a problem that existing systems like you know your React routes and all of those things yeah. have solved. But it's at the cost of code then, right? Like it's all code that needs to be sent to the client, which increases your payload, delays the actual activation point of that code because it needs to be loaded first, because JavaScript itself doesn't stream. Like it needs to be yes. fully there before it can start executing. Yes. Uh, I, I guess things like loading state, you need to re-implement that as well. Um, but again, things that, that people have have already done. So the argument I've heard from the the other side on this is that you've got this big JavaScript bundle. Mm -hmm. Or you've got a JavaScript bundle that is that is formed of the, the code to repeat this stuff that the browser already does. But you load that once and you're done. And that's cached. And you you navigate around 10, 20, 100 pages, mm -hmm. you've still only loaded that JavaScript once. On the flip side of that, you might have also on your page some other heavy scripts that are not in your control, such as your, you know, a, a really bad Add script or mm. an, like an analytic script, which is badly made, but for business reasons you can't remove it. Yeah. And again, like in a multi-page app, you are loading, you are parsing that. You're, you're hopefully not downloading it every time. Hopefully there's some caching going on there, but who knows? Fingers crossed. Yeah, it, it, you're you're definitely evaluating that JavaScript mm. every time. I mean, that's what I mean. Like even measuring that behavior on sites that are already in cache. It's not necessarily the primary use case. Like if, we, if we talk about blogs, then it's like, I'm interested about people coming to a new blog post that I published. It's good if some stuff is cached because they're on my site before. Maybe my header logo is cached or whatever, stuff like that. But the content itself will still have to be downloaded. And if I stream static so HTML, it will be on screen sooner than if I first load a page, even from cache, JavaScript from cache, then fetch the content and pipe it into the documents. But then the, the SPA solutions that we see now, I mean, I, I think when we were having this argument 10 years ago, and I have blog posts from 10 years ago having this argument, the SPA systems at the time were not doing any server rendering. And I, th there has been a, a mindset shift there. Because at the time, the people who were building the, the frameworks were telling me like I was wrong mm -hmm. for saying that server rendering is much faster. That, that has shifted now. It's it's now pretty much universal that a server render or a, a static render markup in your page yeah. is the right thing to do as a first step. I mean, that would have like, been my next question. Is it a dichotomy? Can you only be one or the other? Or can you do both? Or is there a way we can reap the benefits of both? Because I feel like that's kind of where. But it also depends on what both means. True. So what we see with Next.js and, and the, the similar systems is that the model of doing both is to deliver the, the markup for the page, mm -hmm. but then also deliver the JavaScript for that same page. So basically, you, you duplicate the content. Yeah, which is like you, you end up with a lot of redundant execution, recreating a page that's already there, but also like um, redundant in terms of download. And, mm -hmm. and so this is a problem actually we faced with Squoosh recently, and I don't even know if we landed the fix yet. But you know, I, I inlined the Squoosh logo mm -hmm. because one of our metrics was scoring us down because that logo wasn't appearing fast enough, and it's a you know it's yeah. right at the top. So I inlined it, but because we do follow that system where that view is delivered in HTML, but it is also then delivered in JavaScript, that fairly complex SVG is now twice in the code, and it was. You know, SVG can get big. Yeah. I was the, I was umming and ahhing about inlining it to start with, but now I'm inlining it twice. Hmm. And what I ended up doing, and this is horrible and hacky, was, like, it, you know, because it's all it's a shared component. But the component said, like, if I'm running on the client, just go and get this element, get it from the DOM, and get the before you re-render, and get the yeah. inner HTML, the outer HTML for yeah. it, or whatever. And so it was then only once in the in the markup, but then you're, you're relying on sort of doing the inner HTML tricks. And That's that what I always thing. feel like is a solution I want for this whole hydration problem, I guess, where you send you send server 
rendered markup. But then you want to hydrate, make it that make the, the the leap to an SPA where now let's say Preact takes over. But once Preact boots up, it does this whole I render the DOM and updates everything. And for that, it needs to have the same DOM markup in its own VDOM thing. And my in an ideal, it was like okay, just grab the information from the HTML to grab the state and to grab the components. So you don't have to carry that in the JavaScript code. Well, that's actually quite hard. It is. And, uh, and it would be interesting to see if we can get a system where you could say, like, well, a lot of this page is not interactive. It's never going to change. You mm. know, can I just send the code for these little islands? Yes, I'm going to be controlling the whole page later on. Yeah. But it's only these like four buttons and this one button that have any interaction and any changes, uh, any SPA style changes associated with them. But as you say, it, it's it's a hard problem. I think in terms of the the discussion tends to get dominated by the two sides, and I guess one side of it is is us, which are like. Look, if the browser can do it, well, then just let the browser do it. It's going yeah. to be better at the optimization, blah, 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 blah. But the other side of the, of the discussion, I think, gets dominated by the people who work for a, a desktop application that people leave open in a tab. Mm. And I think a lot of people bet on their site being one of those, like when they set out and it doesn't come true. Because like, thinking of the tabs that I have open all the time, it's Gmail, uh, Calendar. Oh, it, 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 uh, get up notifications maybe, for me. Oh, get, get up notifications as well for me. It's it's very few sites, and I think to sort of start off saying that you know I'm going to bet my performance on being one of those is is tricky. And and I think pe people maybe don't realize how often a page reload happens. One of the, the things like you, you could oh YouTube Music. This is quite an, an app that is slow to load, and they yeah. I'm sure they've made this bet. That, yeah. hey, people are going to leave it open because, look, in a multi-page, we've got to play your music. We can't change the pages. But the amount of times that I have been listening to something, and it will say, related artists are here. And I'm like, open oh, it in a new tab. I'll open it in a new tab. And do you know what? That doesn't work. <laughs> the amount of time like I ended up duplicating the tab and then clicking the link, because it's not a link. It's, of course not. And and so there, like if you're betting on this one upfront load, and then it ever happens again, people who middle click to open you know, if you're on the, the, the home page of a, a blog, a news site, you click all of those, you're hitting that like full every reload time. every time. Yeah. And the other side of it is that the reason I said desktop is on mobile, that long lived thing just does not happen. No, the browser intervenes. The browser intervenes and closes the page. So when the user goes back to it, like or, or even just back to that particular tab, it might have been evicted for you know memory reasons. And so you're gonna hit that full page load again. So betting your performance on being open all the time, I don't think is a safe bet to make. Yeah. Yeah. I I find I still feel like browsers have a a mode where they excel and that's what I'm always trying to, to figure out when the apps I write. And I, I think it's the MPA, but I don't know. Like it's I feel I feel I feel less and less confident like I, I guess it's as always like it's not a single answer, right? Like the context matters. Um, yeah, I think we, the browser can do a, should do a better job of attacking this from both sides. Like, one to provide the lower level primitives uh, or even like mid level primitives for making SPAs better. One of these is going to be app history. Oh yeah, like the history API is awful. Like it's one of the, it's really badly designed. <laughs> the, the new app history API is essentially just you, you may as well have called it history two, right? Like yeah. that's the you know it's just like let's get this let's do it properly this time. So. Yeah, there's a better lower level primitive, but then you know the mid level ones, things like you know caching scroll position. Could we just have more? You know, because there's loads of code for that in the browser. Why can't we just expose it more? But then I, I mean, that's another thing why some people feel pushed towards the SPA approach because they want to have nicer transitions, right? Like have more control over how a navigation looks. Because so yeah. far we've had no control for developers. And that's attacking it from the other side. Is like, what can we improve about MPAs to, you know, some of the reasons people might go SPA, you know, and they're taking on all of that complication. Is it for for some reason that we can just fix? Yeah. And the other part of that would be shared element transitions. Yeah. Of like, you know, can we do the nice swooshy swooshy thing from page to page that I know, you know, <laughs> some people do. Like they go full React just to get that. And it's like, well, for those people, can we close the gap there? And that's that's not like, you know trying to ban SPAs or anything. It's just like, if that is the only reason you're doing it, then we can just it's a lot of complexity to take on state management and element 
like a code loading, turning it into a DOM element and doing the transition, which often involves all kinds of get bounding client direct shenanigans. And we could just let the browser do it, who already knows where everything is on screen. Yeah, and this, this is a bit of a, I don't know. Like, we did an episode recently on memory leaks. Mm. Uh, tell you what's great for a memory leak situation, reloading the page. Yeah. There's, so if you're doing an SPA, you need to do be doing so much better with your memory management. And as we've seen, like that's hard. It's hard. It can be very surprising when something leaks just because you had an event listener the wrong way. Yeah. And a lot of the you know the SPA frameworks have done a good like they've solved those problems. Yeah. Hopefully. Maybe. Um, you know, over time they'll spot a lot of stuff, but the, it's harder to stop the people building on top of that from creating those problems. Like the, the users of the framework, because mm. it's that problem of like you add an event. List. So, well, the sort of stuff like we're supposed to be good at this, right? And we saw the problems that we had on on Squoosh. Oh yeah, right. And it's it's like it's stuff that on the surface you think, oh yeah, that's like a beginner mistake to do that. Of course, that's going to leak. And it's like, yeah, but we did make the mistake because it's hard to spot when this happens. Yeah. Because you're um, just, oh, just going to put a retest observer here, and then suddenly that in combination. Oh, look, I'm taking no responsibility for that. That was a browser bug that we fixed now. I'm but still going to blame didn't you. Even, but yeah, but I didn't even think to, to check that that was working yeah. or not. And, you know, it turns out it was broken in all browsers. <laughs> um, so what is your bottom line? <laughs> Sim <laughs> dumb it down to one answer, which is better. Someone SPA needs to go thing. home. Uh, if we could just wrap this up. I think it's it's what you suggested before. I think like rather boringly, there's there's no universal it right depends. answer. It depends. Yeah, and the idea of like I, I know like my blog, I build it using Preact, but only to generate statically. Oh, but you then build it with React. It's, you know, you, like you, you turn it into a static markup, right? Yes. Yeah. So I'm using I've got JSX components and the lot, and it just generates HTML at the other side. But I do have. Areas like I, I kind of use this stupid markup trick. Like I don't know, I wouldn't recommend people doing it the way I did it because it was just hacky and I needed it for an yeah. article. That kind of says this little bit here is this component, and so if you could make that live on the page, um, and that works really well. I think that's something actually Jason wrote himself about about the the islands of interactivity. That is something that yeah. he thinks more frameworks should model around because it is just like you said, most pages are. Predominantly static. Yeah, and it, I'm not. I haven't optimized for the case. If I say in one of my blog posts, check out this other post. If you click that link, you're doing a full page navigation. Mm. Which, if you if you build the perfect SPA, would be quicker as an SPA. Like if you solve all the streaming issues. Yeah. But I don't see the need on my blog for that level of complexity because, I mean. Uh, I don't think many people, like people are going to see a link to one of my blogs from Twitter or something. They're going to read that article. I, I don't have a high confidence they're going to look at anything else. Yeah. Or, or even if they do, they might do what I do, middle click it, like read and, later. And also, there is a difference between the fastest possible way to implement this and fast enough. Right? Like yeah. just because there is a way to do it faster doesn't mean you need to do that or it's worth putting in this effort to save 10 more things. Or even if it's a significant amount, like, if you're still, I always say, like, you know, we have these the rail guidelines. They're a bit potentially a bit outdated. But if you're hitting those, maybe you're just fine. Yeah, I do like fast as possible because it means on a, on a lower end device, it True. Might, that might make the difference. But it needs to be at some reasonable complexity cost. Yeah. And uh, so for e e even at a basic level on the Chrome Dev Summit website in the designs, another company's doing it. It's not me no. this year. But they 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 made the um, the error in in their wireframes that we have seen the I/O website make a ton of times. Mm. That frustrates me, and that is when you uh, click an event, it opens in a modal. Yeah. So you have got your schedule, click the thing, and there's the event, and that creates that problem where you're you know even if you do the right thing and update the URL, you share that. The first thing the other user sees is not the model. Uh, yeah, <laughs> is the page underneath, and then a bit of JavaScript goes. Wait a minute. This I mean, URL unless you do the like... really, you add the complexity and render that page as a separate HTML site, which actually has the modal baked into the markup. Well, what we're going to do, I think, is is roughly that, but without the actual other page behind yeah. it. The close button will then do your navigation yeah. navigation back. Um, but yeah, like that's it. It's it's. You think about the amount of uh, like situations you're you're actually going to be faster for, and are you really? Is that really going to happen? Does it warrant this jump in complexity? You know, and I think that's the question. Like, if you if you have your metrics, if you're good, you already have 
you should feel less incentive to do an SPA or an MPA switch. If there is things to optimize, think about whether that one of these switches could potentially help you hit, hit your goals, be, make a better user experience. Yeah, and it's great that all these sites are doing that, that static render now. Uh, yeah. Because we have seen in the past that sites have gone, oh, wait a minute, actually, if we just don't do the client side stuff, this is faster. And they're able to turn that off for individual pages uh, where it makes sense. And then on a page that has more interactivity, bring there the JavaScript back. Uh, it depends. Great. Get some, get some flat Eric in here. Flat Eric? Flat, flat beat, Mr. Boiso. Flat beat? Yeah, whoop, 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 whoop.